When I came to Southview 18 years ago, it was the fall of 2004, and it was election season. And I had a, we had a two-week-old uh, baby, our first baby, and uh, she's at college now, but home for break. We're excited about that. You know, I, I came into an environment that I, I knew had to be, you know, influenced by the fact that we're so close to D.C., like it, it had to be. But I had no idea, really, coming from Texas, what the political environment here was like. It was, it was a bit of a shock. I remember my first month, I was, I was downstairs, and I was walking through the hallway, and just an hour earlier, this wasn't there. But I walked through the hallway on a Sunday morning, and there were political advertisements on the hallway, like glued up, telling people how to vote. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I did what people do. I just went and ripped them all down and threw them away because uh, that's not what we do. <laughs> um, and, and found myself with a, with a very uh, energetic conversation later that morning with somebody who had put all of those things up. I had no idea the environment that we were in. But 2004 seems kind of tame now, doesn't it? Like that seems like, Really nothing at all. The fact is the 2016, 18, and 20 election cycles were some of the craziest of my lifetime. And I would imagine you would agree. And now we're gearing up for another round. You excited? <laughs> I can feel the excitement in the room. <laughs> No one is excited about this, really. How do we deal with this? What do we do with this? The easiest thing in the world is to do what I have done really for 18 years, which is not talk about it. I tear things down off when I see them on the walls, which doesn't happen much anymore. Um, and I have conversations with people. I have opinions, no surprise, just like you. But there's a purpose in what we do here. And what I want to do this week and next week, for the first time ever, is do what Spurgeon talked about. Charles Spurgeon was, is called the Prince of Preachers. He was a 19th century British pastor. And his biography, there's so many biographies of his that have been written, but one in particular just titled Spurgeon is one of my favorites. Spurgeon was known for teaching other young pastors, and he would say, when you're preparing to teach, you need to have the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And his point there was to make sure that you're not communicating something that has absolutely no relevance to what's going on in the world around us. Otherwise, people just tune you out. You need to connect the dots. I'm not sure I've done a good job of connecting the dots for us when it comes to the topic we're going to talk about this week and next week. And this has been something that has been a conviction that has been laid on me for quite a while now. It came to a head earlier this year when I was at a conference with our staff team, and it was uh, for North Point Partner Churches. We're a partner church, about 110 others. And at this conference, this, this three-day conference, we were, we were there, and I got a copy of uh, Andy Stanley's new book, Not In It to Win It, which you just saw the graphic for this. And Andy said so many things that resonated with what I have been feeling and thinking and what my poor wife and family have been listening to for the last couple of years, really. And they do. They tolerate so much more than you can possibly imagine. What I want to do is share with you from the context of one question, and it's a question that's not new to you. If you've been a part of Southview a while, if you've been here a while, you're going to recognize the question. If you're new, you need to understand this is the lens through which I teach. <laughs> The lens through which I teach is not, how do I feel? It's not, what do I think? It's not, what do other people feel or think? The question that I ask is a simple one. What does Scripture say? This is the question we're going to approach. And what I want to do is talk about this topic from that perspective. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Let's be clear. I am going to tell you to be involved, to be engaged, please. That's part of being a good citizen, a good person. But what I want to deal with 
is the story that we tell. You heard me talk about this the last couple of years. You know, when, when 2020 is nothing but a story that we tell, and it's going to be one day just a story that we tell, the story of COVID and the pandemic, what story do you want to tell? We asked that question two years ago. And I've encouraged you for the last two years to be very mindful and be very intentional about the story that you want to tell. You're crafting that story. You're creating that story one decision at a time. You have a choice. You can tell a story that is crafted around panic and fear and selfishness. Or your story can focus on faith and compassion and generosity. You know who gets to decide that? You do. You do. I do. We decide the story that we're going to tell. And we decide that. We write our stories one decision at a time. One day at a time. One choice at a time. At a time. And my encouragement to you has been for two years that you and I, we can choose to write a good one. We can. We can make that choice. We can make that decision every single day. This is what the leaders of Southview have tried to do for the last two and a half years. Thinking around COVID, when everything hit in March of 2020, we had a lot of decisions to make very quickly. And our elders, instead of meeting once or twice a month, began meeting weekly. We did that for over a year. And that is not our normal pattern. But we did that because we realized we needed to make a lot of decisions very quickly. We needed to pivot. We needed to make sure that we were focused on the right things and having the right conversations. And it was a challenge. And everybody always agreed with everything we did. (laughs) Oh, wait. (laughs) Maybe not. We pivoted to online, you might remember. Our small groups went online. We took our community ministry, our community average ministry, and we dialed it up to 11. We weren't just doing once every four or five month projects or once a quarter projects. We began doing once a, once a month, every month. Like we were dialing it in, not once a quarter, once a month. And we were impacting our community in larger, bigger, and more, more significant ways than we ever had in Southview's history. And that has continued. That's one of the things that has stuck at Southview. And you'll hear our community outreach partners, Adam and Sarah, they'll talk about the projects that we're doing this month and next month. And and it's something that's now part of our DNA because we intentionally dialed that up. We said, we want this to be what Southview is known for in our community. We get to write our story. Now, everybody agreed. Everybody loved that. Everybody thought every decision we made was right, except for the people who didn't. And there were some. And people got mad and people left. And that happens. Shocker, I've been here 18 years. This is nothing new, I promise. Whenever a decision is made, this happens. But we were still doing the work of ministry. We were just doing it differently. We were trying to think, how do I love one another? And this was the thing that drove our decision making. We made an intentional decision not to politicize our church. And that's a very intentional choice and decision. And that is one that will not change as long as there is oxygen in these lungs right here. And I imagine that's true for you too. We're not going to do that. That's not who we are. And so we faced a lot of pressure, a lot of opposition, people saying that we caved to political pressure in this. I get that. And this is a little bit of what I want to talk about. We haven't talked about this like this in two and a half years. But I think it's time. I think it's time that you understand some of the why. The story that we tell matters. And when life is predictable, when everything is going along smooth, everything is easy, well, we don't worry so much about the larger questions. We just go with the flow. But when a tsunami of uncertainty and stress rolls in, Wow, well, then things get real. And things get real real quickly. The uncertainty does not alter our value system. It exposes it. When things are uncertain, when you're under stress, that doesn't change what matters most to you. It exposes it. It reveals it. 
And all of a sudden, we can see it, good, bad, and ugly. Our reactions to our uncertainty around us, the uncertainty around us, our reactions give it away. There's no way around that. And this is super important to, to keep in mind. Our actions don't tell the whole story. Our reactions do. Our reactions tell the story. Because that just comes from what is inside of us. What did we see in the last two and a half years? Well, the reactions to all this uncertainty that has been swirling in our culture, in our society, and in our churches, the reactions exposed what's been true all along. And what people outside the church community began to look in and see, and what they began to, to, to interpret was maybe, just maybe, they don't really believe what they say they believe. Maybe what matters to them most is not what they believe. What matters to them most is winning. They just want to get what they want. And they'll sprinkle some Bible verses on it and baptize it and make it, you know, Jesus-like. But really, people in the church just want to win. And what they're afraid of most of all, what they fear more than anything else is losing. Losing your voice. Losing your rights. Losing your influence. And you know, the funny thing about, about that is that we, we worry about losing our influence, but that's exactly what happens when the church abandons its God-given mission to be the church and to do kingdom work in Jesus' name. That's exactly what happens. We lose our influence. So the thing that we're most afraid of is exactly what happens when we react in such a way that winning is the most important thing. What I've watched the last two and a half years is that many churches and many church leaders, sadly, decided to alienate half of the population, whichever half disagreed with them. And they decided to alienate them and they decided to take sides and they decided to say, hey, the end justifies the means and I'm gonna wrap my arm around whoever I need to wrap my arm around to get what I want because what's the most important thing? Winning. And what am I afraid most of? Losing. The human capacity for self-deception is pretty much limitless in my experience. We can rationalize and deceive ourselves into just about any course of action if we work at it. And we don't have to work that hard sometimes. The human capacity for self-deception is pretty much limitless. And what I have watched too many people, too many leaders, too many people who claim the name of Jesus do is rationalize their behavior in such a way that, that hey, whatever it takes, as long as I win, as long as we win. You know, the thing that, that Jesus was most concerned about when he prayed for us, when he prayed for you and I in John 17, you remember what he prayed for? The thing that he was most concerned about for us? He prayed for our unity, <laughs> that we would be one as he and the Father are one. He prayed for our unity. And you know the one thing that has been sacrificed for the last two and a half years in particular? Unity. Unity. That's what has been sacrificed. That's what's been given up because we had to demonize the other side. We had to demonize them because like they're all lost and going to hell. We have to demonize them. I talk a lot about leadership. And I gotta tell you, in 30 plus years of studying leadership, the absolute worst kind of leader is one who needs an enemy to lead. And guess what? We've seen that. Why, why, why would followers of Jesus choose to alienate half the country? Either half. Why would you do that? Why would you make that decision to alienate half the country and abandon what Jesus called the church to be? One. Why would we ever do that? Why would we make that choice? 
These are the questions. These are the musings and the ponderings that I have. I think the church in general has missed an unprecedented opportunity to demonstrate unity, to live in contrast to the world around us, to show what it looks like to be different, not like everybody else. Too many Christians did exactly what the Apostle Paul warned early Christians not to do. He's writing a letter to followers of Jesus who lived in a place called Philippi. And he said this, he said, do everything without grumbling or arguing. You know what that word everything means in the original language? Everything. It's really complicated, I know. Do everything. <laughs> well, the assumption there is that there were reasons for some people to grumble and argue and complain. That's the assumption. It's a logical assumption. But why not do that to get our way? I mean, sometimes I've got to argue and I've got to grumble. I've got to like make noise so that I get my way. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Why not do that? Paul tells us, don't do this so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. It's about contrast. You want to be different? You have to live different. You want to show up as different compared to the world around us? Then you've got to act differently. You've got to talk differently. You've got to be different. And when you do, you're going to shine among them like stars in the sky when you do that. You're going to have that kind of a contrast. The contrast is going to be so apparent that people are going to stop and they're going to take notice. And they're going to say, I don't, I don't know if I believe what you believe. But wow, you're different. I don't know if I buy all this Jesus stuff yet. But I've never seen anybody act like you do. Imagine the opportunities this gives. Imagine the conversations this opens simply by doing what Paul said. The past couple of years, I think the church has lost some of its shine. And we need to get it back. And we can get it back but it begins with a decision. It begins with a choice that you and I get to make. We have to stop grumbling. We have to stop arguing with one another. And when we do that, you know what's gonna happen? Jesus said it in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. Be the light in the midst of the darkness. We are surrounded by darkness. We live in a sinful and fallen world where darkness is all around us. This is not hard to see. You don't have to go far, do you? What's our response to that? To curse the darkness, to grumble against it, to argue against it? Hmm. Let your light shine. Be the light that this world needs. Instead, we've watched people demonize and criticize people they've never met. We've watched people demonize and criticize leaders that they should be praying for. We've seen people demonize and criticize and in so doing, give up the moral high ground. It's gone. You don't have it anymore. And in doing that, all they did was confirm what a whole lot of the next generation thought all along. That we're just in it to win it. That's what we're after. That's what we want. And they grew more and more disillusioned. More and more disillusioned. See, demonizing people in another political party became, well, an exercise in virtue. If you do that, then you're, then you're good. You're, you're right. You're standing. And if you don't, well, you're a pansy. 
People say, we're standing up for the truth. We will not be intimidated. I will stand up for my rights. And I will fight the good fight. I am in it to win it. (laughs) And that sounds good. And you can make good oratory out of that. I can take and I can craft something that will have you on your feet and clapping with that. The only problem is, the only problem is that when you follow Jesus through the Gospels, through the biographies of his life, when you follow the Apostle Paul on his journeys planting churches and encouraging churches, you see something different. And as un-American as it sounds these days, what you find is that the church is not here to win. That's not why we're here. By every human measure, everyone standing around watched the life of Jesus and thought he lost. He lost on purpose. He could have rallied everybody into an army and and gone to overthrow Rome. He didn't. He chose not to do that. He could have stood up to Pilate. He didn't. He lost. From every observer, this is what happened. And he lost on purpose. Why? Because he wasn't here for what they thought he was here for. He was here for something else entirely. And so is the church. So is the church, so are you, and so am I. When we allow our faith to be subjugated to the political party, whichever one you want to pick, when you allow your faith to be subjugated to that, you lose your light, you lose your voice, you lose your distinction. And frankly, as a church, we lose our way. Our faith comes first. When we do that, we lose our opportunity and our privilege to serve as the conscience of the nation. This is what people of faith have always been until recently. Jesus didn't come to win the way that we might define it, the way that people in his day certainly defined it. He came to lead into a different win, a win that nobody saw coming. The Apostle Paul understood this. He got this. And Jesus' followers who were in Antioch understood it. They were called Christians by non-Christians, by outsiders. They were called Christians. It means little Christs. They're like, you're so much like Jesus, you're like a little miniature version of him. That's where the name Christian comes from. They got it. They understood this. Peter understood this. And what happened in the first century is the church changed the world. Everything changed because of how they lived, because of what they did, because of the light that they shone. The church changed the world, and it changes communities, and it changes families, and it changes cultures then and now. Story after story can tell you this. I think many of us in this room would say that the message of Jesus changed our lives. Being a part of a community of faith has changed our lives. Now, I want to be clear again. I said this toward the beginning. I'm going to say it again. I'm not advocating withdrawal from the political system. I want to be clear. You should engage. You should. It's part of being a good citizen. Please do that. Please vote. That's important. We have to do everything we can as followers of Jesus to create a culture that values what Jesus values. That matters. But there are three things. As we do this, there are three things that I want to drill into our hearts and minds. I want us to get these three things right. And if this is all you write down today, I hope you write this down. Are you ready for the three things? Here they are. Posture, tone, and approach. Our posture, our tone, and our approach matter way more than you might have ever thought. 
This is the game changer. This is what matters. Our posture, our tone, and our approach must reflect Jesus, must reflect his way. You've heard me say before, a quote I heard at this same conference I'm referring to. You and I get to choose whether we're going to follow Jesus. We get to decide that. But we do not get to decide what that looks like. That model has been set. It's Jesus. We choose whether we're going to follow him, but we do not get to decide what that sounds like, what that looks like. Jesus laid that model. And when we model his posture and his tone and his approach, instead of what can often bubble up from inside of us, that's a different A divided nation needs a united church. And I'm not sure there's anything I can tell you today that matters more than that. Because see, that doesn't just affect us. It affects the next generation and the generation after that and the one after that. A divided nation needs a united church. This is why Jesus put us here. In his letter to the believers in Jesus that lived in Corinth, Paul is writing and he describes his win, his strategy for winning. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. He describes his mission, his vision, what this is going to look like. And he does it in a way that is so compelling and so clear, sometimes we just run right past it. He's writing to him and he says, though I'm free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now, we might read this term slave figuratively. In the first century, this was not a figurative term people threw around. This was a present reality. I've told you before that anybody in the first century could become a slave. This was not based on the things that that we contextually know in our history, race. In that day and time, if another conquering nation came through and conquered your town, Guess what you were now? Slave, right? It didn't matter anything about you. You're just in the wrong geography. If economically you had a bad year, you might become a slave. Like this was reality, this was norm. So understand how Paul's using this language. He says, though I'm free, I belong to no one. I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Huh. Even people I disagree with? Do I, do I want to win them? Even people in the other party? Even them? Do I want to win them? Paul decided to adopt this mindset. He had an agenda. It was an other's first approach. This is how Paul would choose. Why? To win as many as possible. This is the goal. Not to win. To win as many as possible. His goal was to win people away from a self-centered worldview that's focused on themselves to a new way of seeing everything and everybody that had the posture, tone, and approach of Jesus. Now, you might think about this and look at this. Make yourself a slave to everybody. You're going to submit to and serve other people as a way of influencing them? Because I don't think that's going to work. I mean, Jesus tried that. What happened to him? He died. Paul, I I, I don't think this is going to work. But Paul's not done. He says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. So Paul's going to adapt and adjust based on his audience, based on who he's talking to? Hmm. He said, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law 
though I'm not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. What's Paul doing? He's changing his posture, his tone, and his approach based on who he's dealing with. Why? Because they matter more than his comfort does. They matter more than his preferences do. He cares more about them than about his own opinion. Hmm, that's striking. And this is Paul's mission. This is his strategy. He continues, he says, to the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. He said, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. What's the win? What's the win? For Paul, the win was to introduce as many people as possible to Jesus to the life change, the life transformation that he brings. That's the win. And Paul was not going to let anything stand in the way of that, including his own views, his own preferences. You might listen to that and think, gosh, what a compromiser. What a pretender. If you're a Gen Xer, you might say, what a poser. Who acts like that? I mean, come on, Paul, take a position. Don't just stand in the middle. Don't just live in the middle ground. Take a stand. You're either hot or cold. What, are you afraid of losing followers, Paul? You afraid of people not reading your letters anymore? You afraid of people not not following you around, listening to your teaching? (laughs) Trying to have it both ways? You know, a lot of church leaders were accused of that these last two and a half years. Trying to have it both ways. Trying to stand in the middle. Take a stand. We did take a stand. We did. The stand was that we refused to politicize the church of Jesus. We refused to politicize the movement that Jesus started that so far transcends anything in the political sphere in importance and in impact. We refuse to do it. And I'll be forever grateful for our elders and our leaders who were unanimous in this choice. We decided with one voice, this is what matters. This is what's important. You know what mattered most? Posture, tone, And we've tried to model that, imperfectly to be sure. Have we messed up? (laughs) Yeah, because we're human, just like everybody else. But this was the goal. This was the center. We wanted not to alienate people that Jesus loves. We wanted to embrace them. No, there's a, There's a theologian, an author that you've heard me mention before named Tim Keller. Might be familiar with that name. Keller is, was the the pastor of of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, which as you might imagine is a little bit of a difficult place to minister, right? It's a little bit of a challenging environment there. And Keller has has since retired and is currently undergoing some, some very serious health challenges, some stage four pancreatic cancer treatment. You can be praying for him. Keller said something recently that I think is very important for this conversation. And I want to share with you what he said. He said, when the church as a whole is no longer seen as speaking to questions that transcend politics and are way above it, when it is no longer united by a common faith that transcends politics, then the world sees strong evidence that Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx were right. That religion is really just a cover for people wanting to get their way in the world. 
because winning is most important. When I heard that the first time, it was like a hammer on a gong. The reverberations of that statement are so vast and so significant. And what I want, I want for the church, I want for our church to resist the temptation to try to use our faith and try to use Jesus as a means to an end. I want us as the church, our church and all of the church, I want us to resist this because when we don't, when we try to baptize and sprinkle scripture over and justify and rationalize, this is what happens. Outsiders look in and they're not impressed. Outsiders look in, and they're not drawn to this. They're not leaning in. They walk away in disgust. Because this is what they think already. And all we did is confirm that. Let's resist that temptation to try to leverage faith language to get our way in the world. Because that's not the posture or the tone or the approach of Jesus. We were at a volleyball game the other night. Our younger daughter, Allison, plays, and they did the Pledge of Allegiance. You're familiar with this, I'm sure. And in the Pledge of Allegiance, there's a, there's a phrase that you might have said, I'm guessing, at some point in your life. One nation under God. Can we agree as followers of Jesus that God is first? That our king is first? And everything else is under that? One nation under God? Can we agree that our ultimate allegiance is to our king, Jesus, a better king than any earthly king that has ever existed? Can we agree on that? This is the foundation for what I'm going to talk about next week. Because what I want to talk about next week is, what do we do next? This is, this is what Scripture says. We've gone through and seen what Scripture says about our posture, our tone, and our approach. But what do we do with that next? What do we do now? This is what I'm going to talk about next week. And I'd love for you to be a part of this. I want to pray for us, and then we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, I'm not sure I've ever been more nervous before a series than this one. And yet, I could not get away from a sense that you wanted this talked about. that your church needed to talk about this. My prayer is today that despite my incredible imperfections in the spoken word and in delivery, that your message has come through loud and clear. That the model for our posture, our tone, and our approach is Jesus. May we remember the words of Paul. What the win is. What the goal is. And may we remember the incredible privilege that Jesus has given us to be light in a very dark environment. May we not squander that or waste that. And may we never try to leverage faith language any purpose other than yours. May we remember our true allegiance as followers of Jesus. He is our king. I pray this for all of us.
in the name of Jesus, as we leave this place, may we carry this posture, this tone, and this approach into every environment we go, to work, to school, in our neighborhoods, in every conversation, in every relationship. I pray in the name of Jesus.